less than 50 years old, fractal geometry is a relatively new branch of mathematics. While its roots stretch back over 100 years, it really began to blossom with the advent of the modern computer. As you can see, it's not the geometry taught in grade school math class. And that's a good thing, because nature does not seem to care much for grade school geometry. Where are the straight lines, the regular polyhedra, and the perfect circles of standard geometry? They are rare, at best. We're going to see what we can learn about this new fractal geometry. But be warned, when you look deeply into fractals, you come face to face with the infinite and the infinitesimal. Are you ready? One of the first fractals to reach the public eye was this one, the Mandelbrot set, named for its discoverer, Benoit Mandelbrot. Get a good look at the overall shape. You'll be seeing it again very soon. As we move in, you will notice one of the defining characteristics of all fractals. The shape of the entire set is reproduced in miniature, many times and at many scales. 
Because the resemblance isn't perfect, it's called quasi-self-similarity. Self-similarity, at least approximate, is found in all fractals. You may wonder how far we can go into this thing. In theory, the details keep going deeper and deeper forever. In practice, our computer limits the number of digits we can calculate with, creating a practical limit to the depth of our explorations. But each part of the set looks different from every other part, so we won't see the same thing as we zoom into a different area. And while it's hard to believe, all of those infinitely complex twists and curls are connected to each other. Though the path connecting different points may be infinitely long. At this point, you may be wondering where this crazy-looking object comes from. How does the computer know what to draw? Believe it or not, it isn't random. It's not complicated, either. Let's go back to school for a moment to learn about a class of numbers called complex because they're made up of two parts. One part is real, the kind of numbers you're used to from math classes, like one, negative seven, the cube root of 35, and pi. The other part is called imaginary because it involves the square root of negative one the name imaginary is an unfortunate choice. Imaginary numbers are no less physically meaningful and no less important than numbers like pi or the square root of two. And just as we use a symbol for pi because we can't write down the actual value, we also use a symbol for the square root of negative one. It's a lowercase i. Every point on this complex plane represents a different complex number. For example, 2 plus i would be found here. Negative 2 plus 2i would be found here. If we represent complex numbers with an arrow from the origin to the point, then the arithmetic of complex numbers can be done graphically. For example, when we add complex numbers, we just line the arrows up head to tail, then draw in the sum to complete the triangle. When we multiply them, we simply add their angles from the real axis and multiply their lengths.
Squaring a complex number means doubling its angle and squaring its length. And that's all the math we need to draw the Mandelbrot set. To determine if a particular point is in the Mandelbrot set, we repeatedly square it and then add the original number to it. Now square that and add the original number. Square that and add the original number again. As this simple process is applied over and over, most points will lead to larger and larger numbers, which wander away from the origin. Some, however, will lead to numbers that stay small. These are the numbers that make up the Mandelbrot set. We shade these points black. The color comes from those numbers that are outside the set. We color those based on how long it takes before we know they're wandering away. So the Mandelbrot set is the set of points that do not wander away from the origin under the repeated mathematical operation of squaring and adding the original number. Notice that at every point in the picture, it is the original value of that point that is added after squaring. That means every point in the plane has a different value added to it during the operation. What if you added the same value for every point in the picture? That is, choose a single complex number, C, to add after squaring for all the points in the plane. Then you create a different type of fractal, called a Julia set. It is named after Gaston Julia, who published a paper in 1918 that included the formula for generating a Julia set. Of course, he didn't have a computer, so he was not able to see the infinite complexity and great beauty of his set. Notice the self-similarity at all scales, just like in the Mandelbrot set. Julia sets can be connected. That is, every point is linked to every other point through the set, as in this case. Or they can be totally disconnected. In this case, no two points of the set are connected. As we zoom in, you will notice that what appeared to be a solid structure is really a set of isolated points. Such a set is sometimes called a dust. What determines whether a Julia set is connected or not is the constant that is chosen to be added during each iteration. If that constant is in the Mandelbrot set, then the Julia set will be connected. For example, if we construct the Julia set using this point as the constant, we get this connected Julia set. If we choose a constant from outside the Mandelbrot set, then the Julia set will be a dust. We can create an interesting animation by slowly varying the constant, moving it in and out of the Mandelbrot set.
While arithmetic can lead to beautiful fractal images, we can create a different kind of fractal from a simpler process. To demonstrate, let's start with a large square. Imagine the square is divided into three rows and three columns. Let's remove the middle square. Now repeat the process with each of the remaining smaller squares. Divide each square up into nine smaller squares, then remove the center one. We're going to drop the red lines now, but continue the process over and over. Keep doing this, and you create a fractal known as a Sierpinski carpet. The self-similarity is apparent. We built it in by repeating the process of removing the middle on smaller and smaller squares. An interesting question we might ask at this point is, what is the area of this object? At the beginning, let's say the sides were of length 1. That makes the area one square unit. After one removal step, the square lost one-ninth of its area. What's left is eight-ninths, which is about 0 0.8889 square units. After the second removal step, each little square lost one-ninth of its area, again reducing the total area by a factor of eight-ninths. After the third removal step, each tiny square again lost one-ninth of its area, reducing the total area by another factor of eight-ninths. At each step, the area is reduced by another factor of eight-ninths. When you multiply a number smaller than one by itself over and over, the product gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Mathematically speaking, if you continue that forever, the final product will be zero. This means that, if we really do an infinite number of iterations, this fractal will be made of an infinite number of points, but have an area of zero. That's remarkable for an object that clearly takes up space. Let's take a look at a different fractal to see the opposite effect. This time, we start with a straight line segment, which we will say has length 1. Rather than removing a piece, we are going to replace the middle third of it with two segments. Each will have one third the length of the original segment. While the original line segment had a length of one, these four pieces each have a length of one third. That's a total length of four thirds, or about 1.3333. The length increased by a factor of four thirds. Now each of those segments goes through the same replacement process. Again, the total length increased by a factor of four thirds. Notice the length going up each time. If you multiply a number greater than one by itself over and over again, the product keeps getting bigger and bigger. If we continue this process for an infinite number of steps, we will have a fractal known as a Koch curve. This fractal remains on the paper it started on, and yet its length is infinite, though it never crosses itself. That leads us to another interesting question. A line is one-dimensional. It has length, but no width. The Koch curve seems to be different. In fact, it must be different since it is infinitely long and yet remains contained on the paper. Can it really be one-dimensional? To answer that, 
we need to define with mathematical precision what we mean by dimension. Let's start with some objects whose dimension we're comfortable with. I think we can all agree that this square is two-dimensional. We write d equals two. To double the size of the square, we need to put together four copies. To triple its size, we need nine copies. We are scaling the object up by adding together multiple, smaller copies. Doubling its size is scaling it up by a factor of two, which required four copies. Tripling its size is scaling it up by a factor of three, which required nine copies. If the scaling factor is s and the number of copies required is n, then the relationship is s raised to the d power equals n. Here's our definition. Dimension is the power you have to raise the scaling factor to in order to equal the number of copies required. We can use this relationship to guess how many small squares it takes to increase the scale by a factor of four. Four squared is 16. So it should take 16 small squares to create a square that is four times larger. And so it does. Let's try a three-dimensional object. Now d equals three. To double its size, we need eight copies. To triple its size, we need 27 copies. This works. We seem to have a good definition of dimension. So how does it apply to the Koch curve? This full-size curve can be thought of as being made up of four identical pieces, each a copy of the whole. One, two, three, four. It takes all four small copies to make a larger version that is three times bigger. One, two, three. So three to the d power must equal four. Now, how do we figure out what d is? We need to use logarithms. The result is the log of n divided by the log of s. In this case, n is four and s is three. So for the Koch curve, the dimension is the log of four divided by the log of three. As we suspected, it isn't one-dimensional. It's somehow bigger than that. But it isn't two-dimensional either. Interestingly, fractals can have fractional dimension. What about the Sierpinski carpet? The full-size carpet can be thought of as being made up of eight identical smaller carpets. It takes eight copies to scale it up by a factor of three. So the dimension is the log of eight divided by the log of three. Although it started out life as a two-dimensional square, removing all of its area reduced it to a dimension less than two. Now let's make fractals with some three-dimensional objects. As with the square, we are going to remove pieces from this large block and then repeat the process over and over with smaller and smaller blocks. Start by imagining the big block really consists of 27 smaller blocks. Then remove some of those smaller blocks. 
remember the pattern that is left. We will be using it over and over again. Now do the same with each of the remaining smaller blocks. Imagine them each being made up of 27 tiny blocks. And remove some of the tiny blocks, leaving the same pattern behind each time. Now let's watch the process from the start, through several iterations. It forms an object called a menger sponge. This object is losing volume with each step. If we continue this forever, it will have zero volume, even though it has length and width and height. What's the dimension of this object with no volume? It must be less than three, right? It takes 20 copies to scale it up by a factor of three. So the dimension is the log of 20 divided by the log of three. As we suspected, it's less than three. We can get very different looking fractals by leaving a different combination of small cubes at each step. Here are a few examples. We can do it with other shapes as well. Here is an example that starts with a tetrahedron. Let's go back to the fractal drawing board to see how this iteration process can be used to make something that looks surprisingly real. This time we're going to add something at each step. Call them branches. At each step, we're going to add two smaller branches to each of the outermost branches. Before we worry about realism, we're going to have some fun changing various parameters like stem length and angle. By varying the angle of the stems, we can see a range of overall plant shapes.
If we combine this with an increasing stem length, it starts to resemble a plant sprouting. Ignoring the fact that real plants don't grow this way, you have to admit, it's a good start. It's still a bit too uniform to look realistic. Adding just a bit of randomness can help with that. We can even simulate a tall skinny plant in a breeze by just adding some oscillations to the angles of the limbs. If we take this outside and make it a three-dimensional process, we can create fairly realistic looking trees and plants. Even mountains, coastlines, and clouds have fractal characteristics. So this new fractal geometry is not just an obscure branch of mathematics. It has shown us that very complex structures can be built with very simple rules applied repeatedly. but it has also given us a new way to create beauty. It is, truly, a crossroad between science and art. And it's one that you can explore on your own. Every fractal in this movie was generated using free software that is available to everyone on the internet. Do a web search for free fractal generator and start your own fractal explorations. <laughs>